Uh, next up, I am uh, honored to invite two guests to share a bit more about their work and what solidarity looks like to them as well. Uh, first off, we have Vanessa Leung, who is the co-executive director at the Coalition for Asian American Children and Families. CACF is the nation's only pan-Asian children and family advocacy organization bringing together community organizations as well as youth and allies to fight for the equity uh, uh, to fight for equity for the APA community. I am also excited to welcome Kafri J, who is the founder and executive director of Hip Hop for Change. Hip Hop for Change is a nonprofit in the Bay Area that advocates for systemic change through grassroots organizing, arts programming, and educational events. So please welcome Vanessa and Kafri. Hi. Hi. Welcome, welcome, Thank welcome. You. I'm so happy that Thank you. you're here. Um, but so just, just to kick off, um, I, um, I'm so excited that you, that you both are a part of this event today. And Vanessa, I know that you're in New York City and Kafri, you're in the Bay Area. So I love that we have these, this bi-coastal representation here today. I, I love for you to be to give you a few minutes to um, share about what your organizations are actually doing and uh, um, uh, just a little bit about who you are and, and you know, what you're putting out in the world. So Vanessa, would you like to start? Sure. Thank you so much, uh, Malik, and, and all of you all at Act to Change for putting this together. Um, I'm Vanessa Liang, um, pronouns she, her, hers, and I'm co-executive director of CACF. And I'm a child of immigrants, um, born and raised in New York City, um, and a mother of three boys. So I'm, I'm really always grateful to be able to work with an amazing team at CACF and, and energized by the community we build every day. Um, so since 1986, CACF has focused on advocating for equity and opportunity for marginalized Asian New Yorkers. And our work is focused on systems change, really transforming our communities for the better. Um, but we know to be effective, we need to have strong community leaders, strong community organizations, and that we can't do it on our own. I mean, as a co-executive director, that that partnership itself reflects what we believe is needed for real change in communities. It's collaboration, it's transparency, it's respect and it's trust. Um, so our work is grounded in that. Um, we can't make real change for our community if we only have just a few lone stars doing this work. We need a full constellation of us bringing our range of perspectives and gifts to this work, grounded in our shared values, our understanding, focus on our common humanity and, and committed to understanding the root causes. Um, we need to be, you know, not just troublemakers, but troubleshooters. We need to have the focus on solutions to address the inequities facing all of our communities. So as a coalition, we yearly unite our diverse Asian American community um, to fight for improved schools, healthcare access, other support services for Asian American families struggling with poverty, language barriers, immigration, we, we develop leaders in our community who are invested in social justice and dedicated to growing our real collective voice and power. I mean, for over 15 years, we've worked with young people to realize the importance of their voice in policy change. Um, and then finally, we work to ensure that our community organizations are supported. Um, we have nearly 50 community-based organizations, nonprofits in the city. Um, and they provide the vital, culturally competent, language accessible services that are often the only lifeline um, for so many in our community. Um, so that's what we do every day. Um, and we believe in this work that it is not just about me, it's not just about us, it's, 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 it's work that we need to do together. Thank you so, so much for that. I, I, um, I just love like all the words you use around shared humanity and collaboration and respect and um, and particularly, obviously, because of what Active Change is doing, um, the work that you're doing to uplift young people and actually get them engaged and get them involved is, is just really inspiring. Um, Kafri, I'm going to give you a chance to let, let everyone know what, what uh, Hip Hop for Change is all about and tell us a about yourself as well. Yeah. Hello, y'all. Thank you so much for having uh, me and Hip Hop for Change. My name is Kafri Jake. Um, yeah, I'll start off just saying right now, three corporations own 90% of the depiction of hip hop culture. This is a culture. It's not just music. It's how I walk, talk, dress, paint, think, and act. And most kids in America are hip hop cultured or at least hip hop curious. Um, the industry right now is making money off 75% suburban white men between 18 and 24. And it's their taste for hip hop that is really painting what the industry is pushing. 
a really homogenized narrative that is indicative of what corporate media has always perpetuated about black culture, right? And every community has idiots and, you know, violent people, but, you know, that's not who we are. And, you know, a lot of people like Taco Bell, but they don't think that represents Mexican culture. So our job at Hip Hop for Change is to make sure that number one, um, the entirety of the world knows that hip hop is beautiful and they don't have to part like the Red Sea when I'm walking down liberal Berkeley uh, streets, you know, because I look hip hop culture, you know. Uh, but I think, you know, primarily our main goal is to build a base of self-determination for hip hop culture, for people to access that culture, because hip hop has this ingrained nugget of self-affirmation that for some of these youth, when they go through our program, and we've taught 25,000 kids K through 12, it's some of the first times they get to deal with the, the idea and concept of, of, of being worthy and valuable, and hip hop does that. Uh, and when you see a room full of second graders break dancing and rap battling, it's a no brainer. So. Uh, we also give jobs and employment to local hip hop artists to become educator, trauma trained educators. And we throw fat hip hop shows that perpetuate social justice. So we're building back this whole thing. We're taking back the game. We're fighting for our culture. That was so beautiful. I'm so moved by everything you're doing. And also, you know, I, I think one of the things that we're trying to do at Act to Change certainly is, is to get, let young people know as well that they are worthy and valuable. But also, like, when we see ourselves as worthy and valuable, it, it makes it easier for us to see others as worthy. Yeah. And I think that is always like a way to eradicate uh, hate and bias. So I just, it's, it's just really amazing to hear about um, what, what both of you are doing. I would love to um, just dig a little bit deeper and ask you both uh, to help me and all of our listeners better understand how can we be most effective in supporting change? Because one of the things that's come up a lot uh, lately and particularly in light of all the violence against um, our elder community and the Asian American community is how important it is for us to listen to folks who are actually on the ground, like yourselves, for folks who are advocating for solutions that come from the community. And I, and I hear you, you know, Kafri, um, I, I, I hope I'm hearing this right, but this idea that like hip hop hip culture has been co-opted by, by um, people who don't really understand the culture and have biases against the people who are actually part of the culture. So how can you share, what is the importance of community-based organizations? And what kind of support is most helpful from folks who are not working as closely as you are on the ground to uplift your work. Um, and Vanessa, I'll start, I'll start with you. Yeah, I mean, first I think I wanted to set some context of like the Asian American community in New York City and, and the importance of community-based organizations. So nearly a quarter of Asian Americans in New York City live in poverty. You know, Asian Americans have in New York City have the highest poverty gap or really intensity of poverty. So that means it really just shows that there's there's a huge cost of how do we bring those folks out of poverty. Um, the majority of us are foreign born um, immigrants ourselves. And, and during that pandemic, what we saw was Asian Americans experienced the largest increase in joblessness. We had 50% of Asian Americans living in some of the hardest hit areas during the pandemic. And Asian Americans are twice more than more likely to test positive for COVID-19 than their white counterparts. And yet they're less likely to be tested at all. So our member, like as a membership organization, we hear from, from our groups who are on the ground that they have to do so much more at, at the height of the pandemic and now as we're you know as we're starting this fight for our recovery you know they're the ones that have been on the front lines translating outreach materials and information and rights to healthcare like navigating websites to help secure a vaccine they're the ones providing the food and cash assistance um, and helping families stay safe as they're living in overcrowded housing or addressing the rise in domestic violence it's the, they're supporting these families that have that fear of not just the uncertainties of essential work, the lost jobs, deportations, um, but also kind of this fear in this community around this, you know, what we've been seeing. I mean, we've seen the reports of, of more incidents, bias-based incidents and, and violence, but we've known for long that this has been happening all along. Like, it's just, I mean, now I'm like, it's it's great that folks are coming forward to share those stories of, or report these things. Um, but I think folks on the ground, have, we've been seeing this, we've been seeing this violence for, for a while. And I think the solutions here is what we need to focus on is trauma-informed care, the healing that needs to happen, 
um, the focus on you know what we need to do in the long term um, to really support communities um, that are you know I, I feel like our, our leaders on the ground have been handling their own trauma but also supporting the trauma of the of the communities that they're serving this is like an immense time of a, a lot of struggles for uh, community organizations and I think um, it is this focus that for CACF, like we want to make sure that they're properly funded. Groups need to be invested in. Um, we want to make it easier for them to really talk about the struggles of their communities. Um, so really focus on how we dismantle systems of oppression and address racism that really impacts all of us. Like this, this challenge of, of addressing um, bias-based anti-Asian incidents and violence is, is not something that we do alone as an Asian API community. It's something that I feel like in New York, we've been calling like, we need to do this together as New Yorkers. Like we need to not have siloed conversations. Like we need to talk about what this means for us together. Um, like we don't want Band-Aid solutions and, and knee-jerk reactions and, um, you know, and, and justify kind of more investments in policing of our communities. Like we need to look at, yes, we need to immediate immediate support for um, survivors of incidents. Like we need to for, make sure that they have the support and resources, the language access to feel like they can feel that they are you know, living in a safe community. We need to redefine what safety is. You know, safety is not just the absence of crime and violence in our community, it's actually the presence of wellness. And if we need to focus on the presence of wellness, we need to be investing in all of our communities here in New York. Um, yeah. And I think what we need to do, and like this is when I'm like calling for folks here is like, you know, add your voices to these calls for equity. It's like amplifying these stories from the ground. It's calling for funding of organizations that are trusted sources of support. Um, you know, there's ways to volunteer at these organizations um, that are addressing these immediate emerging needs. But I feel like part of it is taking that next step um, to draw the connections to what these challenges we're facing right now and how these are connected to longstanding issues. Like what are the root causes to poverty, food insecurity, low wages, health inequities, violence? Like that's the only way we're actually going to move forward. Um, is actually not just treating the symptoms, but really working together to address those root causes. Oh my God, that I thought that was like so well stated, and I, you know, not to oversimplify, but what I, what I really know, it was like I feel like you, you talked about the nuances of what people are seeing on the ground and how I think there is a tendency from the outside to say, oh, I see a problem, and here's an easy way to fix it that you know I can that I can throw either my support or money to or whatever it is without really engaging with people on the ground to find out how we're gonna how we're gonna change these things in the long run as opposed to just for like this week or next or next month or whatever yeah. so thank you so much for really clarifying clarifying that i really appreciate it coffee i want to give you a chance to answer the same uh the same question yeah you know uh malcolm x said we're not out uh, organized uh not out number we're out organized you know what i'm saying and i think that's one of the biggest things here i mean violence is a part of the fabric of america Right. You know, we're not going to get away from violence and intercommunal violence or whatever kind of violence without a lot of massive systemic change. And, you know, when these stories started coming out, being a black man from Hunters Point, San Francisco, a year and a half ago when the man was uh, assaulted collecting cans. Uh, and seeing what the news put out about the situation and then hearing what the man said about his own experiences and how he felt about the black community that he loved and that supported him and that came to his rescue. You know what I'm saying? Like these stories, especially when they contain these anti-black nuggets, they go around seven times before the good stories about what community work, you know, is doing. And, and, and also, going through these conversations, it's been so hard as a black man, hearing, hearing, you know, some of the negativity coming from the black community around, you know, I, I don't know, just, just the history between Asian Americans and black Americans. 
and, and also talking to Asian homies as well, because like Jenny said, we are so like, I, my experience growing up was so diverse, but that's not the experiences of our parents. You know what I'm saying? Our parents are so segregated here in the Bay Area and they rely a lot on these media narratives to paint the picture of what they know. Uh, we're so segregated, we tend to have these inauthentic experiences. So that's why I'm here. Um, and I, I'm here to make sure that number one, we know that if you attack an elder in our community, black or Asian or anybody, our communities will stand up and we will do whatever is necessary to protect our elders because both black and Asian communities and, and every other community I know, we value our elders, period, you know, first and foremost. But we also see politicians like Libby Shaft who are taking these moments to, to call out the defund the police movement and say they're responsible for these attacks happening and using these attacks and moments as political scapegoats when in actuality, she was the one that stopped the police patrols in Chinatown and Oakland. I'm, we, won't, we won't get on that too much. But it, it's just important to know that there's a lot of community you know, work going on. And we don't get the big microphone that, that you know, that white supremacist, anti-black or anti-Asian sentiments get in mass media. We, we need to push that. So if you're a, a community member and you're wondering what to do, you, first off, you have a voice, right? And you can use that voice on Facebook if you want to, you know, to share the love. Uh, you can put your efforts, your, your your money, your resources into a lot of these community organizations that are doing work, because whether you know it or not, the work is going on and it always has, especially between black and Asian communities, right? We need to get connected to these ancestral practices of resistance to white supremacy because the orange man, uh, 45, signifies the last vestiges of white supremacy that we're seeing right now. I have this quote on my arm, you know, first they ignore you, then they fight, you, uh, ridicule you, then they fight you and then they lose. They are fighting right now. To, to survive, you know, and keep this white supremacist power structure here. And racism is a learned, it's learned behaviors, right? And we know there's more racism happening. And it's sad when I see black people, black youth on camera uh, robbing or, or just evilly pushing people down and people are being burned and whatnot. But that stuff happens in every community, you know? America is a violent place and it, you know, mental health not being taken care of, these things are gonna happen until we have massive systemic change. But what we need to do right now is to make sure that our people have hope and hope is based in the narratives that are going around. So it's my job as a community leader to make sure that my community knows, hey, bro, we're out here. We're in these streets. We're doing the solidarity marches. Like, this is it. There's always going to be a few people that are, are, are losing it and, and wrapped up in this violence. And there's going to be a whole white supremacist power structure that is trying to push these narratives. But it's not Asians versus Black. It's not Black versus Asians, right? It is not that. And we have to make sure that people know it in our community. We have to make sure our elders who are so segregated amongst themselves know that we're doing this work and hopefully give them hope so they can come out and join the rallies and come out and join and then start sharing on Facebook that, you know, Black and, and Asian solidarity stuff is going on. So that that's why I'm here. And if you want to get involved, stuff is happening. Just and if it's not happening in your small town, make it happen yourself. So, <laughs> so I'm so grateful that you talked about one, like that, that everybody has a voice and they have opportunities and ways to use it. But also the idea of engaging people on intergenerational levels and bringing them into the movement and building solidarity that way. We just, I sadly we only have just like a few minutes left, but I did want to, um, and you spoke about this so eloquently already, Coffrey. But I did want to um, just expound on, you know, an act of change where. We're definitely trying to walk the walk and bring different voices to the table and understand what we can be doing better and what organizations we can support um, with your own or organization, with Hip Hop for Change. Um, are there things that you guys are doing to build solidarity across communities of color, and, and what do those what do those look like? Uh, I'm just curious how how you how you build that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you you literally you have to be the change you want to see, right? We throw events. We're an event-based organization education. So when that thing happened with the elder in Hunters Point, we had an event right at the spot, right? And we had people from Chinatown come out. And we had people from the Fillmore and Lakeview come out. And we had a little barbecue and we shared space and we shared music and song. Like you don't you don't fight hate with you know news reports about the hate that's going on that are myopic and don't put the social context of why things are happening and just point the finger at black folks and then they get out real quick. 
what we've got to do is just create these moments because we're not trying to take, I, I could care less about these narratives that are going on in media. What I care about is the, the brothers and sisters that I'm gonna be walking by in the street corners in my community. So if I can create an event, like Hip Hop for Change has had, you know, two different talks right now. We're about to have a, a fat hip hop show because, you know, Asian people are big in hip hop. Like we don't have a problem with racism in hip hop. We're based on the uh, principles of peace, love, unity, and having fun. So, you know, what we're gonna do is have as many events as we can and elevate Asian voices and black voices together and show what we've already been doing in these communities. We just need people to know, and, and I could care less because I don't think that the media is gonna ever represent any black and brown people well i don't i'm not it, that's not part of my solution my solution is organizing with the people i see on this call and this talk right now and community organizations like that because through that we're going to make change and change will come it's slowly but focus on your local community and if it's not happening make it happen there because you know we don't do this because we think we'll succeed we do this because it's the right thing to do so. mm. Thank you so much. And also just, just you know, to tie this in, I know Jeannie talked about this too, and I'm hearing you say it as well, but this idea that our, our news feeds and the headlines we see are, are not always representative of what's happening on the ground. And, and organizations like yours are, are places that we can turn to to find out what is actually happening and what can we do to help. So thank you so much for that. Vanessa, I want to give you uh, a few minutes too to respond to that too about building uh, a coalition across the yeah. of power. But I mean, doing so, yeah. Yeah, at CCF, I mean, every day we're, we're working to dispel the model minority myth. And we are doing that at, like at a systems level because that stereotype has been used to you know, not only justify underinvestments in the Asian American community, but also in underinvestments in other communities of color. I mean, I, I think we need to start changing that dynamic that we know the work must include confronting anti-blackness because it hurts all of us, right? It's, it's the, it's the, constant threat to black lives it's it's the separation we saw of latino families at the border it's it's dismissing the rights of indigenous folks and and it's actually rendering oftentimes our asian american communities as as invisible especially our, you know the poor and and working class so you know we have to start having sometimes difficult conversations in in our asian american community like you know we're we're highly immigrant here in new york city and, and as a community here, it's it's it's, it's I, I, what we see is that there's a lack of racial literacy and and this knowledge of our shared history fighting oppression. So I mean, I you know it's 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 one of these balance. Like I understand so many individuals, families in our communities are are needing to survive. I mean, it's almost a luxury to be able to talk about oppression and think through this stuff. Um, but it's obviously they, you know, not realizing what internalized racism is. But you know, we've seen parts of our community live in their segregated bubble, um, calling for the status quo to remain, and and we need to push back against that. It's oftentimes, you know, we often don't even realize the trauma we're facing ourselves, but also the trauma we've caused um, in other communities. And so, it is part of believing that, you know, I, you know, we don't have to hide our struggles. Um, that we can actually also demand that our systems do better because i think that's where um you know it's this constant field to to be seen um but it's also like we can call for you know our our government to be doing better for us um that's the work about actually transforming our city systems it's improving public schools our access to care it's 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 supporting culture responsive sustaining education in our schools it's about you know um better implicit bias trainings and investing in that. Um, but, you know, the work to build solidarity is is real work. Um, it's clearly can't be done when it's just convenient. Uh, <laughs> and it really just requires hard conversations. Um, you know, and I think, you know, to create change, we, we need to know our collective history. We need to uplift the stories of those most marginalized and silenced. Um, and, and we need to better understand that it's, it's this work that we need to do together and invest in um, because systems of oppressions um, have made us believe who is worthy and who is fully human and who is not. So like we need to be invested in that work um, in the long run. Thank you so, so much. And thank you to both of you for having a hard conversation, you know, and for, for creating um, an opening for, I think, all of us and hopefully everyone who's tuning in to have the conversation continue having those conversations as well. So um, moved by both of you. Thank you so much for being here today. 
Um, please stay in touch with Active Tangible, stay in touch with you. And um, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you.